But until sanctified love to serve the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I'm thankful to be part of a movement that believes in standards and standing for the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, no matter what others say. I'm thankful that the holiness movement has always been a movement to stand for God, to remain separate from the world. And I've heard it said before, if you're not standing for anything, then you're going to fall for everything. And certainly we need more than ever people that will stand for the Lord People say, why do you do some of these things? Why do you dress like that? Why do you look like that? Why do you not go to this place? Why do you sing these kind of songs and not these newer finangled songs and so on? They say, you're just an old-fashioned person, but I like that chorus that says, My religion's not old-fashioned, but it's real genuine. Two and two are for today, as they were in my Lord's time. Modern ways don't make the difference, they can alter space or time. My religion's not old-fashioned, but it's real genuine. And I'm thankful that we can be part of something that's genuine. It's not an old, old person's ways, but it's the Lord's way. And I'm thankful for what he's done. If you have your Bibles tonight, I'd invite you to turn to a familiar chapter in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And when we hear that, we automatically say the love chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and there's probably been many sermons that have been preached out of this chapter. And we're going to be reading this in two different versions tonight. But first, I would like to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love. We're so thankful, Jesus, for the way of holiness. We're thankful, Lord, for the Bible, the inbreathed Word of God that you have given us, Lord, to be able to read, to study. Oh, God, that you've given us something to abide by. And, Lord, we're thankful that we can have sanctified love. And, Lord, this, this, challenge, or this chapter rather challenges us. Lord, even if we're sanctified, I know, Lord, that it challenges me, Lord, to be better, to be more for you, to improve in these things as this chapter would hold. And I pray, O oh God, right now, Lord, I pray for your help. I'm nothing, Jesus. And Lord, I just pray for your help, Lord, that you would be with your servant tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's not a real long chapter, so we'll read all 13 verses. And then I want to read the same chapter again in a different version. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, first I'll re read it out of the, the good old King James Version. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, and have not charity, or love, I am become as a sounding brass, or a tinkling sim cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy, and understand all mysteries, and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains, and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor... And though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long, and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, asketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things, charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake like a child, as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For, we, for now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as I also am known. And now abideth faith, hope, Charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. The Apostle Paul's not just talking about love, as that old word there in the, the King James, we use the word charity today. Let's see if I have this on. There, I think I have it on now. As the, we use this word charity today, usually we're meaning that we're doing some good acts for some people. That was a, 
good or we donate to a charity. And so they would say that was real good charity. But we understand that this word, if we have the King James Version tonight, means love. And this word love is thrown around today in all different kinds of things. Well, I don't know, I like uh, McDonald's iced coffee. And when my, if I'm not careful, maybe I say, oh, I love McDonald's iced coffee. It's real good. Or we'll go to our favorite pizza place. I understand there's some good pizza places around. We'll say, I love that pizza. Or, and then we'll turn around and say, I love my wife. Or I love my dog. Or I love this outfit. We just throw this word around so many times. But you know, the Bible is careful to have different uh, definitions of love and explaining what these are. And here in 1 Corinthians 13, it's important to know, as, we, as, as uh, we've studied this chapter, to know he's not just talking about, like, I love uh, my shoes or, or this type of love, but no, he's talking about a sanctified love. The word here is agape. We know what that is. The highest form of love in Scripture. A love that belongs to the sanctified. It doesn't belong to anyone else, but it belongs to those that have surrendered completely, totally, and entirely unto Jesus and the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I want to read this chapter again, and I like the Amplified Version. I like to read it as, in, in, in some sense, as commentary after I've read my King James Version. And I like how it explains things and, and kind of gets into some definition of, of the Greek. And it reads, and I'll read all these verses again, If I can speak in the tongues of men and even of angels, but have not love, that reasoning, intentional spiritual devotion, such as inspired by God's love for and in us, I am only a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers, that is the gift of interpreting the divine will and purpose, and understand all the secret truths and mysteries, and possess all knowledge, and I have sufficient faith, so that I can remove mountains, but have not love, God's love in me, I am nothing, a useless Nobody. I like how this version explains this. Even if I dole out all that I have to the poor in providing food, and if I surrender my body to be burned, or in order that I may glory, but have not love, God's love in me, I gain nothing. goes on to say, love endures long and is patient and kind. Love never is envious nor boils over with jealousy, is not boastful or vainglorious, does not display itself haughtily, is not conceited, arrogant and inflated with pride, is not rude or unmannerly, and does not act unbecomingly. Love, God's love in us, does not insist on its own rights or its own way. For it is not self-seeking, it is not touchy, or fretful, or resentful, it takes no account of evil done to it, pays no attention to a suffered wrong. It does not rejoice at injustice and unrighteousness, but rejoices when light and truth prevail. Love bears up under anything and everything that comes, is ever ready to believe the best of every person. Its, hope, its hopes are fadeless under all circumstances, and it endures everything without weakening. Love never fails, it never fades out or becomes obsolete or comes to an end. As for prophecy, that is the gift of interpreting the divine will and purpose, it will be fulfilled and pass away. As for tongues, they will be destroyed and cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away, that is, it will lose its value and be superseded by truth. For our knowledge is fragmentary, incomplete and imperfect. And our prophecy, our teaching is fragmentary, incomplete, and imperfect. But when the complete and perfect total comes, the incomplete and perfect will vanish away, become acquainted, void, and superseded. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. Now that I have become a man, I am done with childish ways and have put them aside. For now we are looking in a mirror that gives only a dim, blurred reflection of reality as in a riddle or an enigma. But then when perfection comes, we shall see in reality and face to face. Now I know in part, imperfectly, but then I shall know and understand fully and clearly, even in the same manner as I have been fully and clearly known and understood by God. And so faith, hope, love abide. Faith, conviction, and belief respecting man's relation to God and divine things, hope, joyful and confident expectation of eternal salvation, love, true affection for God and man, growing out of God's love for and in us. These three, but the greatest of these is love. 
or sanctified love. I like how that explains it. Really explains it. It even sounds like when you're reading portions there, I've heard some good holiness sermons of what they describe, what carnality is, and it even sounds like some of their descriptions they give, even though the King James doesn't word it just like that, has the same meaning, doesn't word it just like that. It sounds just like some good holiness preachers that I've heard that have worded what carnality is. But this evening, I want, to, I want to break this chapter down, and I want to uh, go through the entire chapter and see what it would have to say. And first, I want to note that if we read those first three verses, we'll notice that sanctified love is key. And, and a title for this message could be Sanctified Love. Um, and the first point that I want to mention is sanctified love is key. We'll notice in verse 1 that it says, though, notice he says, though, he doesn't say, I am, but he says, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, in this version they'll say of even angels, of, uh, of angels, and have not love or sanctified love, I am becoming as a sounding brass or as a tinkling single symbol. You know, I really believe that Paul was dealing with the tongues movement in Corinthians, an unbiblical tongues movement, and in the holiness movement and in the church of the Nazarene, we don't believe in tongue blabbing. We don't believe that we just say a bunch of words and, and formation, but we believe in speaking in tongues as in languages, as it clearly says. We believe that Paul is speaking in a rhetorical way, saying, though I speak with the tongues of men or even of angels. He's not saying that we do speak in the tongues of angels. But we notice that Paul is really dealing with a tongues movement here in the Corinthian church. We notice that the people are placing so much emphasis on this gift. And maybe they're placing emphasis on a correct understanding of the gift and languages as we read in the book of Acts as it said they all spoke in their native tongues, which would mean languages. We've heard the stories about the missionaries that have gone into places and God gave them the gift of tongues. They didn't know any Spanish, but God filled their mouth and they spoke fluently in Spanish, the gift of tongues. But, you know, Paul was dealing, I believe, with, with a, maybe a true, um, and I, I'm not sure, but um, maybe dealing with a true what is tongues, but he was also dealing with the false tongue movements. But what he's getting at is there's too much emphasis placed on this. They were placing a lot of emphasis on this whole tongues gift. And many of them, it would seem to reflect from this chapter, they weren't even sanctified or not even filled with the Spirit of God, that they would even be able to have the gifts of the Spirit. And yet they were claiming to be able to speak in tongues without being sanctified, without having sanctified love. The Paul says, this is just a bunch of useless racket. What are you doing? And who knows that the scripture says it as like symbols, uh, clanging symbols and all this racket. Uh, somewhere I read, and I can't remember where it was, they said in pagan worship that was used. A bunch of clanging symbols and racket. Paul makes a strong statement here. He's saying here you're placing so much emphasis on these tongues, but without sanctified love, it doesn't mean anything. You're placing too much emphasis on it. He makes a strong statement to say it's just a bunch of racket. It's uselessness. Uselessness. But what he's getting at is, as I mentioned in my first point, is sanctified love is key. Now is Paul saying that tongues as a spiritual gift, that is certainly in the Bible, is not important? No, he's not saying that. But he's saying without being sanctified or filled with the Spirit, this doesn't mean anything. You know, there's a, um, my stepsister, I really love her. My, my mom and dad were divorced and my mom was remarried. And my stepsister went to a, a camp. She's not saved, and I've been praying for her. I, I believe she's about eight or nine years old. I can't remember. Sarah, do you remember how old she is? She's nine years old. And she went to a camp, and every day I've been praying, Oh God, would you set a hedge about her? I plead the blood of Jesus and pray that God would set a hedge about her as she goes through the public school system and, and goes around, has all kinds of influences in her family that are not good influences, and um, many that claim to have something that don't have anything. And they'll act one way at church, and when they leave church, they act a different way. They go to a church where... Uh, the ladies have long hair and long skirts and so on, but when they come home, they don't wear those anymore. They just try to put on a show. Anyways, it was sad to hear that um, uh, she went to this camp, this church camp, and I thought, well, maybe that would be good. 
uh, just did not feel right about it, this denomination. And I'm not going to mention it tonight. And I'm not going to condemn the denomination because I believe there's some that are really saved. But when she got there, they began to do this whole thing. You have to have the Holy Ghost. You have to have the Holy Ghost. You have to have the Holy Ghost. And I'm sure there was a lot of speaking in tongues, uh, perverted tongues, a bunch of tongue blabbing, people that are not even saved. And, and they're going on and on and on, pressuring her, you need the Holy Ghost, you need the Holy Ghost, you know, all of this going on and on and on. And she texted her dad and said, I got the Holy Ghost tonight. And I thought, oh God, here's a girl that I've been praying for for a long time to be saved. She's not even saved, but yet she's received the Holy Ghost, comes home, there's no change. There's no difference. It was just an emotional phenomenon. But the Paul says, sanctified love is key. The gospel message, the message of holiness. We know that we need to repent, to come to know Jesus, and that sanctification is subsequent to regeneration. And Paul places the emphasis on the message of holiness. And he says, you know, there is a place for speaking in tongues. There is a place for these spiritual gifts. But you're making this your God. You're making this your form. It has, as, it's as if people are saying, we don't really want this holiness stuff. We don't really want to surrender, so we're going to substitute for something else. Look how holy I am. I'm just speaking in tongues, speaking away. I know we, I've heard of a lady and... and um, I heard my grandpa talk about a lady he saw in the grocery store. She's living with a man. They're not married. She's living a life of sin. And she goes to one of these charismatic churches and says, Oh, I just go there. I love the music. And it starts playing. They bang their drums and all the garbage and everything. She says, I just get to speaking in tongues so fast, I don't know what to do with myself. What? Not even saved. Living a life of sin. You know, I really don't care what the denomination says. And when it comes down to it, the Nazarene church isn't what says, but it's what the Bible says. The Bible says if you have sin in your life, then you're not a Christian. You're not of God. So what was that of? If it's not of God, then it's defaultly of the devil. She was allowing the devil to come and to say a bunch of silliness and to feel emotional. They were putting emphasis on speaking in tongues. He says, though I speak with the tongues of men or even angels. He was really making a point to these people. What are you doing? They think they're speaking in, a, in an angel language. After we're sanctified or filled with the Spirit, then we receive spiritual gifts, such as speaking in languages or tongues. <clears throat> Next thing he mentions there in verse 2 is prophecy, uh, um, preaching. And prophecy, is, as we learned in Bible college, is not only foretelling the future, like uh, maybe there are some maybe modern-day people that through God they can prophesy something. That sounds a little uh, strange to us, maybe, but I believe that God can use it. But prophecy is not only foretelling, but it's forthtelling, proclaiming truth, preaching. That's what prophecy really is, is preaching, modern-day preachers. And Paul says there in uh, verse 2, he says, and, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And we'll get to the faith there, but focusing on prophecy. Though I can prophesy, I can preach all day long, and I haven't been sanctified, I haven't yielded to God, I don't have the sanctified love, doesn't mean a whole lot. When we're sanctified, God gives us the power and helps us to be humble and where he wants us to be. It makes me think of some people that are so eager, in a, in a not a good way, rather, not trying to help out people, but they want to be seen behind the pulpit. They want to be seen and heard, and, and any time they have a time to preach, they'll tell everybody, yeah, I preached, I preached. Do you want to uh, hear, hear what I said, or do you want to watch the video, or do you want to watch the cassette in a way to just bring themselves glory? I'm not saying to witness to somebody or if a family wants to see it. But any time they have a time to preach, they want to do it. That's what they focus on. I preach. I preach. I preach. I preach. I'm a preacher and all of this stuff. And I want to go preach everywhere I can. But Paul's saying, what is he saying? That's not going to be a substitute. You can't just latch a hold of one of these spiritual gifts that you're not even sanctified. You're trying to latch a hold of something here. And you're not focusing on sanctified love. Scripture says, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and knowledge, I'm, I'm nothing without that sanctified love. Next we'll note that he talks about, though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains. and have not charity, I am nothing. Whoa, this is a big one today. This whole word of faith movement, this mighty uh, of faith. 
You know, if, if you have, if uh, Sister Sarah has a sickness, they'll come down here and say, Sarah, if you really have the faith, you're going to be healed right now. And if you can't be healed, it's because you don't have enough faith and you're an ungodly sinner. Focus on this and that. There's been a lot of people, these television evangelists that, that say that, and people come up and say, I've been healed, I've been healed. And they go home and die of cancer. They believe they were healed, but they weren't. Place so much emphasis on that. You don't need medicine. God doesn't intend you to be sick. If you have faith, he'll heal you. Real perverted view of faith. And I, I've heard some people that are so um, audacious to say, by his wounds we are healed, and they're not meaning spiritually, they're meaning physically. So basically what they're saying is in the Bible, when Jesus says, by, by his wounds we are healed, that Jesus died, that we can have physical healing. Why? What would be the point of that? No, my Lord and Savior suffered and bled and died that I might have life and I might have it more abundantly. Jesus died as the scripture says, wherefore Jesus also suffered without the gate that he might sanctify his people. Jesus didn't die to heal us physically. Jesus died to heal us spiritually. That we might have this life. That we might go on into the next life. And we will realize in the scripture that Jesus condemned those cities and those people after he healed them that weren't serving him, that weren't walking with him, that weren't giving him the praise. He condemned it. If we're healed of a sickness, it doesn't mean we're going to heaven. We can praise God and thank him that he healed us. I believe in healing. I know God can heal people. It's not what I'm getting at, but a focus on this. Too much so. And though I give to the poor, in verse 3, Many people, they, they focus their righteousness on giving to an organization. Or they'll put on, on Facebook that I helped do this, and I helped do that, and I donate to this. And they're not even saved. Not even walking with God. Doing, um, these, um, these people trying to make their own form of holiness. But it will never substitute. We can give to the poor all we want. We can go out and do all the deeds we want, but it's never going to be a substitute for holiness. Jesus said, you need to die out to yourself. Jesus said, you need to surrender. Jesus said, if any man, if any man were to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. So many people focus on that. Verse 3, though I give to the poor even. Well, notice in verse 3 also, though I give my body to be burned. Paul makes even a bolder statement. People will give themselves to be burned and have not that agape, sanctified love. I'm nothing. You're nothing. When God has been calling us to holiness, we cannot impress Him or, or to make Him happy with other things, especially when we do something in our own way, in our own ways, and try to dodge holiness. We're never going to please God. But He calls us to holy, holiness. It says in the Scripture, just as He who has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of, conver of your conversation or lives. Sanctified love is key. We'll notice that. And, and next we'll notice what sanctified love is. It gives us a description of what sanctified is. In verse 4 it says it endures. Endures all things. Endures long. We'll notice that a sanctified person is able to endure many things. They can go through the trials. We can go through the floods, the temptations and the things and be able to endure it. God is there to help us. Um, it, is, it is patient. We'll notice in verse 4. It says this sanctified love is patient. We're not um, uh, short with people. I know of a lady that there was um, an issue going on and she uh, kind of at a, a tragic time disclaimed somebody as family, said you're not part of our family. You get out of here. She wasn't patient. She was mean. She was short. Unsanctified. We need to be patient. That's what sanctified love is. Sanctified love is kind. Notice in some churches they'll say, They'll, they'll give you a dirty look. They'll look at you and say, you're a worldly heathen going to hell. If you really served God, you wouldn't have that bobbed hair. You're going to hell. Is that kind? Is that love? The Bible says that the true um, fruit of the Spirit, the true uh, evidence of being sanctified is love. Now, maybe you really do believe that, but you wouldn't say it like that. No, sir. A true sanctified person is going to be kind. I like that it says rejoices when right and right 
And when truth prevails, we rejoice in the right. When, when someone gets sanctified, we say, praise God, glory be to God. Or I got saved, praise the Lord. Or this got through, or that got through, praise Jesus. So on and so forth. It rejoices when right and truth prevail. It beareth all things. It's able to handle all of these, uh, all of these things that happen and, and, and yet still remain in a sanctified state. We may cry. We may go through a time where we feel depressed. We may have anxiety. We may have different issues. But we're able to bear it because God has sanctified us, promised to never leave us, is ready to believe the best about people. Notice, we'll notice in verse 7 there. In uh, 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 verse 7, Beareth all things, believeth all things. In other words, believeth all things. Does that mean I believe everything you say? Everything that this person says? Everything that that person says? I believe it all? No, but believeth the best about people. So when I see a person, my first thought is, oh, I don't know about them, but you look for the best. Holiness looks for the best in all aspects. Believes all things as best as it can. It hopes in all things. Its hopes are faithless. Under all circumstances, it still believes there can be good things that can happen. It isn't doom and gloom. He'll never get saved. I don't think he'll ever come to know Jesus. There's no hope. Acting like Eeyore. How many know who Eeyore is from Winnie the Pooh? <laughs> oh, my. There's a lady, a lady I know that says, Well, we'll probably be good to have 20 people here this morning. What? We should believe all things. God's going to bring them in. We're going to have a good church service. We're hoping for 50 people. Holiness looks for the best. It hopes for the best. Its hopes are faithless. Endures all things without weakening is what the Amplified Version th says. It endures everything. There's a lot of things to endure. But with sanctified love, with that establishing grace, we're able to endure it. Able to go through the roughest of times, yet remain surrendered to God and everything. Is able to stand when the trials come, when the pressure's on. We're able to stand. And next we'll notice that the scripture says what sanctified love is. And it's the opposite of everything I just said. It's never envious or jealous. Sanctified love is never envious. It's never about ourselves. We're not jealous of others. We don't have bitterness. We don't hold grudges against people. We don't harbor these things. In other words, that uh, let's say 40 years ago, uh, Brother Thomas did this to me. And I don't like that he did that to me. I'm never going to call him. I'm never going to talk to him. And then we take this little pet of bitterness and we hold it to ourselves. Say, so, oh, he did a lot of wrong to me. Poor me. And we just stew in that and have a pity party for ourselves. What does that do? That bitterness begins to grow and grow, and it stinks. It's the stench of carnality. That's not what sanctified love is. It's not boastful or vainglorious or haughty or prideful. I like what as it has been said that two Quakers, and there were many holiness Quakers said, of this man, this preacher boy, I got up, a young man, um, got up to preach, and he got up there and he thought, oh, I'm so philosophical today, and I'll be reading from the Bible, and all of these things, and I just have my theology perfectly, my outlines in place and every point, I know everything, I'm the smartest person in the world. But during why he was preaching, his words got all jumbled up. He went up there thinking he was big stuff, and he messed up, and he went down like this. And the two Quakers said to him, If thou wouldest have gone up like thou camest down, then thou wouldest have come down like thou wentest up. I like that. If thou wouldest have gone up like thou camest down, then thou wouldest have come down like thou wentest up. If you go up humbly, you can leave rejoicing in the Lord. I've done my best, Lord. I leave it in your hands. A spirit of humility is the true mark of the sanctified. There isn't any haughtiness. Verse 4 thinks that things are really good about yourselves. You're better than everybody else. I can do this better than everyone else. I can sing better than anybody else. No one's a better singer than me, or no one's better at uh, whatever. Playing the trombone is me. I'm the very best. No one's better than me. I'm one, I, if I'm not asked to sing, then I'm going to go cry, or I'm going to get mad, or I'm not going to ever come back to the church again because they didn't ask me to sing. Boy, if, I, if, I, <laughs> if we did that, then I don't know how many churches we'd be able to go to. There's a lot of churches, they, 
They just schedule those who want to. A lot of these people that get offended, they never approach them and say, could, maybe I could be on the singing schedule in a, in a spirit of humility. It is not conceited or arrogant in verse 5. It's not self-centered. It's not all about me. And no one else matters. As the scripture says, it's not conceited or arrogant. It's all about me. You'll notice in verse 5, it's not rude or unmannerly. It's not disrespectful. We're not rude to people. So in other words, if someone gets on your nerves, you don't get short fuse with them and blow up and say, I don't want you here. Get out. No, we don't do that. I mean, we may be tempted to do that every now and again. Boy, this person's driving me nuts. You know what I've done? This is kind of funny. Someone's called on the phone before, and I think it was a telemarketer, someone that was trying to sell us insurance, and he went on and on and on and on, and I just picked up the phone and put it in the refrigerator, <laughs> closed the door, and Sarah said, well, you need to take that out. You need to talk to him, and he's just going on and on and on on the speakerphone, and I said, oh, I'll just put him in the fridge, and finally, I took it out and said, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm, okay, well, I'll talk to you later, you know, and hang up, but you know, the, the temptation could have been to say some pretty rude things to him. Don't you ever call back here again. I hate all of you people. And use all kinds of, say all other kinds of things. No, that's not what sanctified love is. It's not rude. It's never rude. It does not twist. It does not about its own rights, verse 5. It's not about my rights, but it's about what God wants. It's not self-seeking, seeking everything for me. I want the biggest plate of food. I want the best chair. I want the the best uh, seat, I want this or that, all about me, 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 why your uh, poor uh, sister or your poor brother over here doesn't get anything, but it's all about me, I'm going to be there first. That's not what sanctified love is, it's not touchy, it's not so touchy about things, someone comes up to you and, and says something and they're really complimenting you, but the way they worded it didn't seem right, and go, oh, that, that offended me, I don't want to talk to that person anymore. Very touchy over little things. You'll find some people you talk to, you try to be nice, but it ha seems like it happens every other time that they're real touchy about things. A very chief sign of carnality. It's not resentful. It doesn't harbor these bitter feelings. There's no grudges, but it's forgiving. Sanctified love is, is very quick to forgive. It may not feel good what that person did to you. It may have really hurt, but I'm going to forgive as Jesus forgave. Just as the Lord was on that cross, what were they doing? The worst things to him. They had him nailed to that cross. I read in the Gospels that Jesus was tortured a lot even before he was on that cross. They beat him. They put him on that cross. They spit in his face. They drove those nails through his hands. They were hurling insults. And certainly he had no clothes on. It was very embarrassing. Oh, it was so horrible. I like this down here. I read that and I saw that there, that nail. But, but he, the first, one of the things he said was, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Wow. Be able to forgive. Can we do that on our own strength? Absolutely not. But Jesus inside of us can enable us to do that and to forgive. I like that chorus, let go and let God have his way. So in other words, when the frustrations come, I get frustrated. Just be, the frustration is not carnality, but frustration can lead to anger, a carnal anger. But when those frustrations come, say, Lord, I'm letting go of it. Have your way in me. I'm letting go of that. What they said, it really hurt my feelings, but Lord, I'm letting go. And pray for that person. That's what you need to do. Pray for them. It's very quick to forgive. Pays no attention to a suffered wrong. Doesn't keep a self-pity pet, as I mentioned earlier. Doesn't stew or, or over things and just let it go. I remember when I was carnal, my grandpa would get after me for doing something and say how wrong I was, and, or he might spank me when I was younger. And you know what I would do? I would go in the other room. It didn't accomplish anything. It just made things worse. But I'd go in the other room and close the door and just kind of say under my breath all the things how he was wrong. You're wrong. You were wrong. Look what you did. You're not good. What was that? That was carnality. I was stewing over that thing, letting it boil, and just all because of myself. But that is not what sanctified love is. It does not rejoice in injustice or unrighteousness. Verse 6. In other words, um, we could say, He got what he deserved, and I'm glad he got it. I'm glad he got robbed. I'm glad his, uh, he got beat and left on the side of the road. I didn't like him anyways. He deserved it. Nope. Nope. That's not what sanctified love is. Or I'm happy that they... Uh, 
uh, and even this could also mean and rejoicing in injustice or unrighteousness. I'm happy that they pass some ungodly law, like recently has been passed in our country not too long ago, that homosexual marriage is okay, so a bunch of queer perverts can get married. And many people are saying, love has won. It's not love. That's of the devil. And people are going to be in danger of hellfire. Or could say, I'm happy that that person was murdered, or I'm happy that they were beat up, or whatever the list may be. When we see people that claim to have something, to be a Christian, and then they rejoice over homosexual marriage passing, the scripture says, no, that's not what God's people do, ever. That you can't even be saved and do that, let alone sanctified. The scripture makes it plain. You know, this evening, I was going over this, and many times sermons are, are not about, I, I never go into a place and say, well, I'm looking all around these people, and I, this is what they need, and I'm going to preach it right at them. I never do that. But you know, recently, I'm going to be honest and open. There's been some things, and I'm challenged. I know I'm sanctified, but the Lord is challenging me to fit this uh, chapter of 1 Corinthians 13 more, to really look at it, to really be patient, to be more like Jesus. And I looked at this chapter, and, and, and I've been studying it, and it's been on my heart, it's been on my mind. I want to do better for you, Lord. I want to stay surrendered. I want your love to flow through me, your holy love. And that's why uh, many times I, I preach things that are on my heart, that apply to me. So I'll say this evening that this applies to me as much as it does everyone else. And I praise God. I'm thankful that the Lord doesn't leave us alone, but he shows us. He shows us right here. I, I, I've been guilty of even saying, Lord, why are you not telling me? It seems like you hear that still small voice says, have I not told you? There you've got this whole thing where I've talked and spoken to you. Have you read it? He does talk, and I'm so thankful for that. Let's stand. We'll close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful, Jesus, for your love. Lord, you live such a great example for us. Lord, you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. But the scripture says you are despised and rejected. A man of many sorrows. The scripture said that you didn't even have a, 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 a stone to pillar your head upon. Lord Jesus, you lived a life of sacrifice, of servantry. Jesus, you weren't concerned about um, all of the comforts of this life, but Lord, you came to do the will of the Father. And tonight, Lord, I find myself challenged to be more like Jesus. Lord, regardless if we go through sorrow or pain, to serve Jesus, to live such a surrendered life to you, to allow that agape, sanctified love to flow through us, to flow through us when we're at Walmart, to flow through us when we're standing in that long line and it's taking so long, to flow through us when we're dealing with our family, or dealing with children, or dealing with whatever the circumstances may be, I pray, Father, that you would help me to be more like you, to be more Christ-like. I'm nothing without you, Jesus. The scripture says, apart from me, ye can do nothing. How true that is. Help us, Lord, to be more like you, to grow. Lord, whether we're uh, 22 or, or 100, we can still grow and be closer to you. And I'm so thankful. And I pray that you would help us in Jesus' name. Amen.